My phone buzzed on the nightstand like an angry wasp, and at first I thought it was the alarm to get up. I picked up the phone and blinked at it as I realized that it had stopped buzzing and I was supposed to have another hour of sleep. Because it wasn't the alarm. It was a text notification. You have a delivery scheduled. I frowned at the phone as I looked at the sender. It was just a series of numbers, letters, and symbols that looked like someone had rolled their hand across a keyboard. Certainly not a phone number or an online store that I'd ordered something from. Super fucking weird, which meant it was probably a super fucking scam. A foreign prince was going to send me a diamond if I would only send money first. Sure thing. Still, there was always the possibility it was legit. I hadn't ordered anything out of the ordinary, but maybe someone was sending me something as a surprise. My birthday was next month, after all. The chances seemed low, but the idea still had enough inertia that I didn't delete the message the way I usually did with spam. Instead, I closed my phone and drifted back off to sleep. When I woke to the alarm a bit later, I found myself checking for another message. I felt a bit of disappointment when there was none, and that, in turn, made me feel a bit dumb. Shaking my head, I went back and deleted the first message, and by the time I got out of the shower, I'd forgot about it almost entirely. That afternoon, I was eating a sandwich at my desk when my phone jumped in my hand. I'd been reading on the internet, but now the top of my screen was filled with a new text notification. I tapped it slowly and sat my sandwich down as I read the full message. Do you have a delivery scheduled? Delivery time will be at 2.45pm. Please be prepared at that time. What the fuck? Regarding the message, I pondered it. Who gives that specific a time, and please be prepared for what? Hey, Becky. I knew she was over there. Just like me, she never took a lunch break. Yeah? I stood up and leaned over the cubicle wall as I held out my phone. Have you ever gotten a delivery message like this? She took my phone and studied it for a moment before looking up at me, her gray eyebrows arched. No, I don't think so. Think it's a hacker or something? I shrugged. Who knows? Probably some kid sending people old messages as a prank. Becky gave a little laugh and went back to looking at her computer as I sat back down to stare at my own little screen. The senator named Junk was different this time, right? Still a mix of stuff that made no sense, but with more letters than before. Frowning at my phone, I debated just deleting it again. Still, something in the new message made me feel a little excited, uh, a little worried. No doubt it was just a mistake or an automated phishing scam, but for the moment, it was making my day a bit more interesting. So even though I knew it was a waste of time and against my rules on responding to sketchy internet shit, I decided to text back. Who is this? What's being delivered? I, I didn't order anything. I chewed the rest of my sandwich robotically as I played on my phone, trying to pretend like I wasn't just distracting myself while I waited for a response. I finished watching a video about an orphaned raccoon or something when I noticed the time. It was already getting close to 1.30. I needed to get back to work, and if something was delivered, I wouldn't be home until after 6 anyway. But my guess was I'd be looking at an empty porch when I got there. My phone buzzed about an hour later. It was my mom asking if I was still coming over this weekend. I was starting to type an answer when my phone shook again. It was a response from the mystery sender. You will see soon. <laughs> okay, so this is either someone being creepy or someone I know doing some kind of practical... A shrieking sound began tearing across the office, and for a moment I had the panicked thought that this was what was coming, that this sound was some terrible thing screeching and wailing as it clawed its way toward me. Then I heard Becky's voice over the noise, and I looked up. What? It's the fire alarm. Come on, we have to go downstairs. Glancing back down on my phone, I caught a final glimpse of the last message before my screen went dim. I stuffed the phone in my pocket as I went with Becky and everyone outside of the office and down the stairs to the lobby of our building. It was a slow process, made slower because I got in front of Becky in case she stumbled and went to fall. I knew she had trouble on stairs, and I didn't want her going so fast trying to keep up that she would 
wound up with a broken neck over what was probably a stupid unannounced drill. But when we stepped out into the lobby, I could already see fire trucks pulling up through the front windows. Something was actually going on after all. I heard anxious murmurs around me as we were ushered by security through the doors and told to cross safely to the other side of the street until they could give us more information. We did what we were told, and within a couple of minutes we were clustered on the far sidewalk like penguins huddled together on a lonely ice floe. There were probably 50 or 60 people out there, and I realized with some surprise that I didn't recognize most of them. I'd worked in the building for over five years, and I hardly knew anyone outside of the guards and the people on my floor, and most of the ones I did know was only in passing. It made me feel isolated and unfriendly, and in other circumstances I would have encouraged myself to do better and be more sociable. But surrounded by so many people in such close quarters, all I could think was my phone buzzed. Delivery completed. Checking my phone's clock, I saw that it was exactly 2.45 p.m. I went over to my email to see if there had been any delivery-related messages, but there was nothing. Looking up, I saw a cop approaching. He looked tired and wary as he drew near the crowd, and I could tell by his expression that something bad must have happened. All he told us was that there had been a fire, and it had been put out, but there was an ongoing investigation of the scene. Due to this, the office was going to be closed for the rest of the day, and possibly tomorrow, and we should call our supervisors in the morning for further updates. You know, they pulled a few people from the crowd a minute ago. I looked around and saw Becky looking at me. What? Those cops? They pulled a few people out a few minutes ago. You were looking at your phone, but I think they got people from the 10th floor. I bet they're questioning them about something. I shrugged. I don't know. Laughing, I added. <laughs> Better them than me, right? I'm heading out. Nodding distractedly as she looked after the retreating officer, Becky said, Don't forget your box. I stopped still, turned back to her. What box? She pointed behind me. That box. Didn't you bring it down with you? It's got your name on it. <laughs> you know I didn't have any... She was right. There was a small cardboard box sitting on the sidewalk right behind where I'd been standing. Where did that come from? Did you put that there? Becky let out a laugh. <laughs> did you see me with a box on the way down? I scowled at her. Did you see me with one? She frowned and shook her head. No, I guess not. I was just paying attention to the stairs mainly, but I don't remember it. I just noticed it a minute ago. It had your name on it, so I figured I must have just overlooked it. Her eyes widened. I think this is your mystery delivery? Uh, I... <laughs> yeah, maybe so. I picked up the box gingerly. It wasn't heavy, but it definitely had something with weight to it inside. I wanted to open it then and there, but it was taped up and people were already moving over toward the nearby parking deck that our office validated. I went along with the herd, hurrying to the third floor deck where I hopped into my car and cut the tape with the house key. The thought that this was a bomb, maybe some extension of some act of terrorism or vandalism in the building, fluttered across my mind, but... I pushed it away. Why would someone target me, of all people? And it wasn't like I wasn't going to open it. I had to know what was in there, right? So I opened it. And... It wasn't a bomb. It was a camera. Small and black, the digital camcorder seemed expensive and nice, though... I hadn't used anything other than my phone to record video since I was in college, so I wasn't an expert. But nice or not, it was a weird gift to send me. I wasn't some big recording guy, and even if I was, I wouldn't lug around a camera to do it. It was then that it struck me that the camera wasn't in a box or a package of its own. It was literally just 
stuffed down in a plain cardboard box. So was it a used gift, or was there something on it already? I tilted the box back and forth, making sure there was nothing else in there before reaching my hand in. The camera felt cold against my palm, and it took me a minute to find the tiny power button on the side of it. It had one of those tiny flip-out screens, and I figured that was the best way to see if it worked, and if there were already videos on it. There was. Just one video. 59 seconds long. It showed a woman going into what looked like a small computer or server room in an office that looked similar to my own. The door was pulled shut behind her by an unseen hand, and when the shot pulled back, it was clear something had been wedged to keep the door from opening again. If she'd had more time, the woman might have beaten on the door and yelled. If she'd had more time, she might have called for help and said that someone was squirting something under the door because I was watching the tip of some black container being pushed against the bottom of the door and squeezed repeatedly. If she'd had more time, she might have begged for them to stop when she heard the snick-snack of a lighter being triggered or smelled the faint traces of copier paper set aflame before being tossed down into a puddle trailing out from the bottom of the server room door. But she only had 15 seconds to react to the door being shut and wedged, some accelerant being sprayed into the room, and the room being set alight. After that, she screamed for help for a few more scattered, painful moments of life. But it was too late for help. Too late for anything. The fire was already eating her flesh, eating her words, eating her life. God, why would anyone do this? And why would they want to show it to me? My phone buzzed on the seat next to me and I let out a startled yell. I didn't want to pick it up, but I needed to anyway. I had to call 911. I had to try and catch whoever did this. Swallowing, I saw it was another text notification and I forced myself to tap it open. You have a delivery scheduled. Nine one one. What's your emergency? I, I, I just got this thing, this package. There was a fire or something in my building, and I was, sir. I need you to slow down for me, okay? Do you feel safe where you are right now? Yes. I don't know. I, I think so. I'm in my car. Okay, that's good. So take a breath for me, and then try to tell me what's going on. <sighs> okay. I work at. It's in the building on the twelfth floor. A little while ago, the fire alarms went off. We had to go outside, and then we were told by the cops that the office was closed. There's some kind of investigation going on. Yes, I'm pulling up dispatch logs and seeing that call went out earlier. Sir, if that's the only reason you're calling, then rest assured that- No! Listen. Please. Just listen. I started getting these weird texts this morning saying I had a delivery coming. I hadn't ordered anything. They kept getting weirder, kind of creepy. And then we were all outside after the fire alarm, and I find a package addressed to me. I open it up. There's a camera in there. There's a video on it of what looks like someone being trapped in a room and burned alive. It looks like it happened on one of the floors of my office building. That sounds very upsetting, sir. You say that you watched this video? Yes. It was terrible, but yes. And you think that this might have happened in your building? I, 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 I don't know. Possibly. What floor do you think it might have happened on? You know, if it did happen. What? How, how would I know? Look, I, I didn't have anything to do with this. I just got this video randomly. So you think that someone just randomly picked you out to send a video of them murdering someone? How the fuck would I know? Look, I, I'm just trying to help catch the sick fucker that did this and... Sir, I need you to remain calm. There's no need to be defensive. I'm here to help. Where are you at right now? I'm... I'm in my car. Third floor of the parking deck we all use for work. It's the closest one to the building. Got it. Sending someone to you now. Just stay in your car with the doors locked for me, okay? And stay on the line. 
Yeah, uh, okay. Oh, maybe the tenth floor? What about the tenth floor? My friend, Becky, said that she saw people from the tenth floor being pulled out from the crowd of cops. So maybe if this video is from today, it happened on the tenth floor. But I mean, the cops should already know where it happened, right? Sure, but as you can imagine, it's been a busy day for all of us. Yeah, sure. Are they almost here? I'll be happy to give a statement and all, but I'm kind of freaked out. I, I, I want to get rid of this thing. Rid of one thing. What are you trying to get rid of? What? The camera. I, I, I don't want to be near that disgusting thing. Oh. I thought maybe you meant the bag under your seat. What the fuck is this? This isn't mine. What isn't yours, sir? I need you to talk to me. I... There's a bag under my seat with gloves on it. I opened it up and it smells really bad. What is this? Did, did you plant this in my car? Sir, you're growing hysterical. Please remain calm. No, no, you, you're in on this. You're trying to frame me for something. What are you talking about, sir? You said... You asked about a bag under my seat. How, how did you know there was a bag under my seat? Sir, I didn't say that. You must have misunderstood me. Listen, I know this is hard, but I can assure you no one is trying to frame you for anything. I... I don't know what's going on. I understand. And I'm here to help. What was it you said you found again? A bag? There was a sandwich bag with rubber gloves in it. I, I opened it and it stinks. Does it smell like carbon disulfide? What? How would I know that? Sorry. Does it smell like rotten eggs? Uh, yeah, I, I guess. Look, I sealed it back up and put it on the seat next to me. It'll have my fingerprints on it, but I swear I didn't put it there. I've never seen it before. I understand. Please, remain calm and remain on the line with me. Someone is almost there. Okay, well, just... Wait, my phone buzzed. Just a second. Fuck, it's another message. Like the other ones. It says, delivery completed. I... I think I need to go. I can drive to the police station or something. Sir, please remain where you are. It shouldn't be much... Someone's coming up now. Good. Stay on the line with me, please. Shit, it's not a cop. It's Becky. Can I get out and see what she wants? Please, stay in the car, sir. But it's just my f What? What are you doing? What the fuck? No, fuck, no, why the fuck? Sir, what's happening? Oh, God. What? No, 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 no. Sir? You've got to help her. Oh, God, she's got to be dead, but you, you have to come try and help her, please. Oh, God, what the fuck? Sir, I need you to talk to me. Please tell me what's happening. Becky. Oh, God. Becky, my my friend from work, she came into my car and pulled out this black thing. It looked like the thing the killer used in the video. She... She squirted something on herself and set herself on fire. Oh, God. She's not moving anymore. So... You're saying your friend Becky from work just came up to your car and set herself on fire. Am I hearing this right, sir? Yes. Why the f- Yes. Yes, she did. I understand. Do you see anyone else around? No, but I, I need to go somewhere else. I can't stay here. Sir, you're now at an active crime scene. Please do not move or leave the area. But I- Oh, no. What is it? I just got another message. It says you have a delivery scheduled. Oh, God, why is this happening to me? How about now, sir? What? How about now what? Do you feel fucking safe now? Do you often feel that you uh, think that 
People are plotting against you. I looked across the steel table at the man sent to evaluate me. He'd been there less than five minutes, and I could tell that he was already anxious to have this over with. Not because he was afraid of me, I was handcuffed to the table and it was bolted to the floor. No, he wanted to be gone because this was a waste of time. I had a strong feeling he'd already made up his mind before he came into the room. The problem was, I didn't know what that meant. Was he going to say I was sane and turn me back over to the police, or was he going to say that I was crazy and keep me locked up in this place? Either way, it was bad, but I wasn't sure they weren't preferable options to being out there in the world. So I was honest. Uh, no. Not until last week when I started getting the weird text messages. The doctor pursed his lips as he glanced over his paperwork. Hmm, right. These delivery messages that you said you received both before and after the, uh, incident at your workplace? I tried to keep the irritation out of my voice. It wasn't... It wasn't an incident. Some poor woman was murdered on the 10th floor, and no, I didn't know her. I work on the 12th floor, and no, I didn't kill her. I was sitting in my office when it happened. The man raised his eyebrows slightly. No need to get angry, Mr. Jacobs. I'm not your enemy. I'm merely here to evaluate you based on uh, your behavior and comments to the police when they apprehended you. That and, well... The series of events that appear to have unfolded around you. I closed my eyes and took a deep breath before responding. Look, I know how this sounds, okay? A woman dies, gets killed in my building, and then my co-worker is found burned to death outside my car in the parking garage. I told the police what happened when they got there, but they still took me in, checked my car and found the bag with the gloves in it and whatever chemical was used to burn them, I guess. I don't know. The doctor interrupted. Carbon disulfide. That's what you told the police was on the gloves at the time of your arrest. Swallowing, I nodded. Yeah, but not because I know that. It's because that's what the 911 operator told me it was. Or at least implied it. He cut his eyes back up at me from the notes. This 911 operator that wasn't a 911 operator? I don't know if they were a fucking 911 operator or not, but they're in on it. They have to be. The things they were saying, the stuff that they knew, they... Somebody planted the gloves in my car. Sitting the notes back on his lap, the doctor looked up at the ceiling. But you say you did call 911. Clenching my hands, I nodded. I did. But, like I told the cops after... After Becky did what she did, I hung up on them. I was going to call someone else to try and find another number for the police or something when I noticed my phone was wrong. Your phone was... Uh, wrong. I sighed. Look at my phone. I've had it for over two years. It's a little banged up, but I've taken good care of it. Only thing is, a month ago it fell out of my pocket when I was getting out of the car. I thought it was broken, but it was okay, except for a little place on the back where the plastic's rough now. It's hard to see, but it would always poke me when I held the phone a certain way. It bugged the shit out of me. But when I was searching for another number to call, I was also thinking about how I could have gotten that crazy person instead of the real 911. Had they messed with my phone? So I checked. The spot on the back was gone. That's when the police came up to the car and ordered me out. I tried to tell them that it wasn't my phone, that it had been swapped out for one that they could control, but they wouldn't listen. I started staring at the table as I spoke, and when I looked up, my stomach sank. The doctor was smiling thinly at me. So to be clear, According to you, you've been getting strange messages on your phone. A woman in your office, in your building, is murdered by arson. 
A few minutes later, you get a video of that murder. A few minutes after that, a woman you've worked with for years comes up to your car, douses herself in something similar to what was seen on the video, and lights herself on fire. And this occurs while you're talking to a mysterious person who is in on it after trying to call 911. When the police arrive, you're in a car with gloves potentially used in these crimes, talking about how your phone is not your phone. You're then arrested, and after being interviewed, you become irate. They give you a sedative and send you here. Is that pretty much summing up? I shook my head. I know how all of this sounds, but check my phone. That phone. It should have at least some of the text messages on it, and you should be able to see that I was on the line with 911 for several minutes. The doctor frowned at me. The problem is, is that they have checked. There's no indication that you got any text messages like you described, and there's no record on your phone or otherwise of you making any calls to 911 or any other number that afternoon. In fact, the only evidence we do have are things that point toward you being involved. There's no sign of any conspiracy, no proof that you're being framed. Just you and the people dying around you. Picking at his pants legs, he went on. I'm not here to interrogate you, Mr. Jacobs. Only evaluate your mental stability. The version of events you have described is, frankly, fantastic and unbelievable. What I have to determine is that if this is a product of genuine mental health issues or simple malingering. He stood up. To that end, we're going to do a series of tests this morning. Assuming that it is still necessary after you've shown what has been found. Someone's here to see you. With that, he knocked on the door and stepped out. As he left, a frail-looking older woman stepped in, her eyes red-rimmed and shining as she looked at me. Mama? Wally, are they treating you okay? She looked so painfully and old and... Then, as she moved and sat down across from me, a small brown sack clutched in her left hand. I reached forward as much as I could, and she took my hands with a warm squeeze. Not being mean and feeding you, okay? I nodded, tears filling my eyes. Yeah. My head hurts from where they drugged me, but otherwise I'm okay. But Mama, you gotta help me. I didn't. The words died in my throat as she raised her hand. Her face was full of pain and sadness as she shook her head slightly. No, oh, honey. Don't lie like that. Not to me. She lifted the sack from her lap and sat it on the table. I've already seen the video you made. I felt my tongue going numb as I looked between her and the sack. I had no idea what she was talking about, but it was obviously very bad. Uh, I... Mama, what video? She looked exhausted as she reached into the paper bag and pulled out a cell phone. She tapped at it inexpertly. They said I could show it to you. Said it might make you see that you're caught. That you can stop lying. She hot out the phone with trembling hands. You take it. I can't, I can't watch it again. I saw my own hands shaking as she passed the phone to me. A video was already queued up, and I could see from the paused still shot that it was me in my apartment. But I'd never taken a video like that. What the fuck was this? My heart thudding. I hit play. And saw myself confessing. I... I just got this thing in me. I opened it up and... I'm a sick fucker. I want to see someone be trapped in a room and burned alive. I want to see Becky, that disgusting thing, set on fire. I need to do this. Listen. Please, just listen. There's a bag under my seat. The video in my car. Catch me. Please. Hmm. 
none of this made any sense. I didn't remember saying any of this, yet it seemed oddly familiar at the same time. I shifted my hand as I held the phone, holding it like that was poking me because on the back... Wait, this was my real phone. I looked up to tell my mother when motion drew my eye back to the small screen. My video self had moved closer to the camera, and where he'd looked tormented before, now he was smiling at me as he said one last phrase. Delivery completed. I looked back up as my mother raked something across her throat, the wound sending out a stream of blood as she tumbled to the floor. I screamed and pulled at my handcuffs, but they didn't budge. And within a handful of seconds, she had grown still. Glittering next to her, I saw what she'd used to kill herself. A set of keys. I struggled to free myself to go to her until my arms and legs ached with effort. And then I sat there alone, weeping for what felt like hours. Finally... Trying again, I stretched out my leg past its limit and began edging the keys toward me. That's when my phone buzzed on the table. Even without picking it up, I could see the text notification. You have a delivery scheduled. The keys were slippery with my mother's blood and I almost dropped them as I contorted my fingers to unlock the handcuffs. My brain was largely numb by this point. Too much horror and insanity had flowed over it in the last week, smoothing out the ridges and contours of... Too much horror and insanity had followed over it in the last week, smoothing out the ridges and contours of order and sanity that had been landmarks in my mind. All that was left was a base drive to survive. That and the quiet complaining whisper that it was too late. Everything was ruined and it was better to just give up now. I ignored that voice. It was my father's voice. The way he'd sounded the last time I saw him in the hospital. I'd been young, but I'd known it was the last time I'd talked to him. In some ways, I'd understood why he was ready to go, but it hadn't kept me from hating him a little. Hating the weakness in him me. I stood up from the table on shaky legs and kept my eyes lifted as I stepped past my mother's body. Now wasn't the time to try and figure out any of these things. I needed to escape if I could, and the next step was trying the second key. The door opened easily, and when I looked out I saw that I was in some sort of trailer. The hall and central rooms were empty and Through a nearby window, I could see lush green trees and tall grass stretching up and over a hill. None of it looked familiar, but my more immediate concerns were the three black cars parked out front. Why were they just sitting? I stumbled as pain flared across my head and chest briefly, gone so quickly that I questioned if I'd felt it at all. Gritting my teeth, I made a decision. I was going to go out and confront them, make them give me answers or go ahead and kill me. Either way, I was done with this crazy bullshit. I flung open the door and caught it as it bounced back. Squinting against the sunlight, I braced for yelling or fists or gunshots. Instead, there was only the sound of car engines running and a distant animal cry that I didn't recognize. I jumped past the folding metal steps going down and headed toward the nearest vehicle, only slowing when the tented window scrolled down and I saw the doctor who'd been questioning me in the driver's seat. You want the car over there, Mr. Jacobs. I stopped up short. What? What the fuck are you talking about? My My mom just killed herself in front of me. What is this? What's going on? He took a sip from an aluminum can before waving it into a small circle. Yes, yeah, it's all very strange and confusing. You're the victim of forces you can't understand or control, blah, blah, blah. 
I'm sure this is all very interesting to you, but it's not to me. So get in that car and drive away. Run while you can. I took a couple of steps forward and I saw the man's drink had been replaced by a small pistol. Stopping again, I shook my head. Just tell me why. Why me? And how are you able to do all this? Control people? My own fucking mom? The doctor shot me a sour look. You're making a mistake. You think all this weird shit means you're special, that you're entitled to answers, that you can demand satisfaction. He coughed into his hand and studied it for a moment before looking up at me with fresh anger. They sent me over because they think you're a candidate. He held up his hand and I could see a reddish black stain on his palm. But the way we do it, it's not so easy on the body. And the longer I'm here, the worse it will get. So you need to decide. Are you going to get in the car and drive away or I'm going to empty this gun into you right fucking now? I felt another flash of pain across my chest and stomach, doubling me over with a gasp. I held up my hand as the pain passed, forcing the words out. As I lurched through the car, he pointed out, I'm going. I'm going. The doctor smirked. Good call. You've got a two-minute head start. Better make the most of it. I froze. Head start? Before what? The man gestured with his gun toward the third car. Before they come to kill you. Buckle up and drive fast. I was driving less than three minutes when I saw the other car approaching in my rearview mirror. I would found some kind of dirt access road and I was driving on it as fast as I could and not wreck, but they were still catching up quickly. I looked around again for signs or some other indication of where I was or where I could go for help. So far there had been nothing, no buildings, no other cars or people, but there was a paved road up ahead and just before it a small white road sign with an arrow pointing right. Glancing into the mirror, I saw they were less than 50 yards back now. I looked again at the approaching sign. What language was that? Russian, maybe? And below that it said, appropriate, five kilometers. What the fuck? The steering wheel jumped in my hands as I was struck from behind. I gripped it tighter and steered into the blow as I pumped the gas and made a wide turn onto the paved road. Turning around to look, I saw that... I shuddered as a wave of pain flashed through my left arm and both legs. I managed to stay on the road, but just barely, and the loss of speed cost me the little lead I'd gained. They were coming up again, and they'd reached me before I got to wherever this town was up ahead. But dim hope stirred in my chest as I saw the first silhouettes of buildings in the distance. Maybe I'd make it after all. I glanced back in time to see them barreling toward me, a man hanging out of the back left window with a gun of some kind. Why the fuck did they turn me loose just to try and kill me? Is this awesome, sick fucking joke to them? <sighs> no. I needed to stay calm. I think slow and act fast. They want me angry and scared. They want me to run. I had to stop giving them what they wanted. So I stopped. Slamming down on the brakes while popping the parking brake sent the car skidding a little, but I held it straight enough that when they slammed into the back, they hit head on. New pain flashed across my chest, but this time it was from the seatbelt cutting into me from the impact. It hurt, but looking in my side view mirror, I could see that I hadn't gotten the worst of it. The gunman had been ejected and flung against some nearby trees like a ragdoll, and as I opened the door, I heard a wail of pain from somewhere in the car behind me. I had the vague worry that I might be shot or run over as I walked away from the accident. But it was just that small, whispering voice again, telling me that it was over, that it was okay to quit. It was the same breathy, tired voice had once told me that I was the man of the house now, that I had to take care of my mom and Rocket, that I had to be strong, I had to be strong while he gave up. Wiping at my face with the back of my hand, I limped forward. I kept hoping for a car or some people, but there was no one. It was strange. 
Things weren't dirty and didn't look abandoned, not exactly, but as I entered the town, I could tell that the buildings were old and hadn't been lived in for years. I had two more shivers of ghost pain, but they faded fast, and I found I was growing used to them. Strange as that seemed. I considered exploring the building, searching for a phone or something, but instead I kept the main road and followed it through town and to the woods on the other side. The road was better maintained, and I had already seen signs that let me know where I was headed. Chernobyl Nuclear Plant. There'd be someone there, even if it was just a guard to keep tourists at bay. My stomach lurched as I saw another black car rolling out from between the trees to my left. This would just never end, would it? I had died and gone to hell or something. That was the only thing that made sense. This was all just endless insane punishment for something that I'd done that I couldn't re My phone, my real phone, buzzed in my left pocket. I'd forgotten I even had it until then. Cursing my own stupidity, I dug it out, intent on calling someone, anyone, for help before they took me again. I froze when I saw I had a new text notification. Delivery complete. I looked back up to see a young woman approaching me. She met my eyes without smiling and stuck a small brown envelope into my hand. When I took it, she returned to the car and sat watching me. I wanted to throw it away, refused to open it, but I was so tired and used up, too tired to fight or rebel any longer. I just needed answers for it to end. So I tore open the envelope and found a small digital recorder inside. When I hit play, a deep voice cracked out from its small speaker. Hello there. I know you've been through a lot, lost a lot, and no doubt you want answers. You want this over with. You want your life back, right? After a pause, as though the recording expected a response, the voice continued. Well, the good news is that if you're hearing this, you're special. And because you're special, I'm willing to give you everything you want. Answers, peace, your happy, normal life. How does that sound? Another pause, and then... Crazy, right? I know, I know, but I assure you, it's true as well. All you need to do is go with the nice lady in the car. She'll drive you to a place nearby that's, well, it's special too. You do what they tell you, and you'll get sent to me. The keys are doing what they say and being willing to do them. For our methods to work, you have to be willing to understand. And you may be asking yourself, what if I don't want to go with this strange lady? What if I want to run or fight? I say to you that those things are fair and reasonable responses. Unfortunately, unlike the scenarios you faced in the last days, this one doesn't have branching paths or built-in chances for your continued survival. There are currently two snipers trained on your position. If you do anything other than go and get into that car, your time in this little experiment and your time on this planet will be at an end. As with all things, the choice is yours. I hope to see you soon. I started looking around as I listened to the recording, trying to see if I saw the glint of glass or metal from a nearby shadow, but of course I saw none. I didn't doubt what the voice said anyway. After all I'd seen, a couple of marksmen ready to kill me seemed almost mundane. Clutching the recorder, I walked to the car and got in. Do you know what the date is? <sighs> Not really. July 22nd, maybe. I've been drugged and chased, and then they put me in that thing, and... Well, I don't know what I know anymore. The woman frowned at me. That's the point of these initial assessment questions. Travel via the bowl can lead to disorientation and confusion, even dementia. We need to see how well you're able to function before starting any orientation. I shrugged. Okay. July 22nd, maybe? Very well. Your mother's name. I 
felt anger flare up in my chest. You fucking know her name. You fucking murder her. It caused her to murder herself. I felt tears burning in my eyes. You know what you fucking did, even if I don't. Sir, I had nothing to do with the death of your mother. Please, tell me her name if you remember. It's Teresa, okay? Teresa Jacobs. Good. And your father? Freddie Calhoun. The woman raised her eyebrow. But you go by Jacobs. I nodded. My stepfather's name. He adopted me when I was ten. Dad was already dead by then. She nodded. I see. Name the first American president. John Hancock. No pause before nodding and holding up three fingers. Okay. How many fingers? Three. Look, I, I'm fine. Just tell me what... Sir, we're almost finished. Count backwards from ten, please. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Good. Have you had any strange mental lapses in the last few weeks or months? Mental lapses? Yes. Blackouts, amnesia, inability to recall how to do a particular task or specific words, anything like that? I frowned. Uh, no. Wait. I thought this was just checking if I was okay from wherever that big bull thing was. The woman sniffed. This is an initial assessment of all relevant matters. Have you had any strange sensations in the past few weeks or months? Unexplained tingling or hallucinations or phantom pains? Leaning forward in my chair, I resisted the urge to grab her. I was unrestrained for the moment, but the austere and vaguely medical feel of the plain room we were in gave me the impression that the restraints were available if I decided to act out. Gripping my hands together tightly, I tried to sound calm. Yes. I've had weird, unexplainable pains. It started yesterday before... Before you people put me in the bowl. She nodded. I see. What's your name? I clenched my hands tighter. Lady, I'm not fucking crazy. I just want answers or for this to stop something. Not this bullshit. Her expression didn't change as she waited. Fuck. My name is Wally. Wallace Thomas Jacobs, or Wallace Thomas Calhoun, if you pick. Making a final note on her chart, the woman stood and headed for the door. Thank you for your cooperation. Someone will be with you shortly. It was another hour before the door reopened and a tall, solemn-looking man entered the room. He brought in a tray with cups of what looked like coffee and a plate piled with donuts. Offering me a warm smile, he sat them down to a nearby table. Sorry, I know you must be hungry, but this is all I could scrounge up for the moment. We'll have you a proper meal soon, though. I shrugged. I'm fine. I'm not hungry. I just want to know what the fuck is going on. I keep seeing this parade of people and no one tells me anything. That's when something struck me. Wait. You're the guy on the recording, aren't you? The one that threatened to have my head blown off if I ran? The man's smile widened as he looked at me. Guilty as charged. But please don't hold it against me. I was just giving you a little push toward making the right choice. Which you did. But rest assured, these theatrics aside, I'm very honest and very easy to get along with. And I think in time you'll find that we have a lot to offer each other. I went to say something sarcastic, but the man had stopped closer and was holding out his hand. But I'm being rude. Coming in and running my mouth without even introducing myself. I put out my hand uncertainly, and the man gripped it tightly, his skin cool and faintly greasy to the touch. You can call me Mr. Solomon. Do you watch much TV? I stared at the man warily. Mr. Solomon had only been in the room for a few moments, but I already felt a growing sense of unease and hatred being in his presence. 
Maybe it was just because he was the current face of all the madness and death I'd seen in the last few days, but I wasn't so sure. Because I felt like I'd been trapped in a hurricane. A chaotic but mindless force without a will of its own. You could try to hate it, but what was the point? But this man... I wondered if he wasn't the one guiding the storm that destroyed my life. Glaring, I shrugged in response. I guess. Solomon smiled and nodded, seemingly unfazed by my stare. Me too. I love it. All kinds of shows, really, but my favorites are always the ones that have a bit of fantastic in them. Dramas with surprise twists, science fiction asking big questions, heroes and villains, life and death, you know what I mean. Yeah. Smirking slightly, the man went on. I understand your slurriness, and I'm going to ignore it for now. Back to my point, the big problem with so many of these stories is that the heroes, and sometimes even the popular villains, aren't in any real danger. No, they pretend that they are, and the viewers go along with the joke, but in truth, there's an unspoken pact between the creator and the audience that the people they really like just... won't die. When I didn't respond, he went on. In your world, do they use the term plot armor? I raised an eyebrow. What the fuck was he talking about? Was he in here talking about TV shows? No, I, I, I don't think so. So the bowl did bring me to another world. Solomon chuckled. Well, yes, of course. I'm not going through that thing to talk to you. We don't even know how it really works, you see. We can simulate it and direct where it leads, but from what we do know, there shouldn't be any side effects to travel if it's done right and well. We aren't doing it quite right yet. He rolled his eyes. And believe me, I'll hear bitching from Jeffries. Sorry, the man that questioned you yesterday in your world. That he had to go over and help collect you. Assuming he makes it, of course. I felt a new fear running up my back. So he's sick from going through the bowl? Am I going to get sick too? Solomon grinned. Most likely not. And... That is a good segue back to what I wanted to talk about. Plot armor. He settled back into his chair. Plot armor is a pop culture term in this world that applies to the story phenomena that I was just describing. If you're the main character, you're safe. Not because you're especially strong or smart or skilled. You understand. You're just arbitrarily protected because you have to live for the story to continue. Whether it makes sense for the plot or the reality of the story is a secondary concern. What's the fucking point of any of this? His eyes narrowed. <laughs> Don't be rude. I'm trying to give you an explanation you might understand. To help you. So don't be rude and interrupt. Or, don't they have manners where you come from? Clenching my teeth, I quietly nodded. Good. Now, as I was saying, plot armor can be a powerful thing in a story, and fortunately for you, apparently you have some yourself. What do you mean? This isn't some stupid story. This is you people ruining my fucking life, killing people that I care about. Solomon waited until I was finished, and then went on. That's only partially true for several reasons. I mean, no. It's not a story, but the principle is the same. He stood up and walked over to a small table with a computer monitor on it. When he turned it on, the image that flared to life on the screen was one of me sleeping in the room. Except I was wearing different clothes, and I hadn't slept since I'd been there. What is this? More tricks like the confession video on my phone? The man laughed dryly. <laughs> no, the video confession was a simple deep fake. We actually pulled all the words you say in that video from your 911 call last week, recut and modulated, of course, but simple enough. This, he gestured back to the monitor, this is something much more interesting. 
The image started moving, and I noticed that the same monitor was present in the video, playing some other movie while the man that looked like me slept. It was hard to tell from far away, but it seemed like that movie was a woman in a bedroom. You're aware now of the fact that there are multiple worlds. What you may or may not have guessed is that there are infinite versions of this reality, or close enough to infinite as to make the distinction meaningless. This video was taken a few months ago, and the man in the video is named Thomas. I looked from the video back to Solomon. Thomas. Like my middle name. He left the monitor playing and sat back down. No. Thomas, as in you. Or an alternate version of you. This world's version of you. A version that is very valuable to us. Sighing, he folded his hands on his crossed knee. Shortly after this video was taken, Thomas left us. Well, let's call it what it was. He escaped. We tried to find him, but his trail died in a small town in Nevada. He swallowed, looking like he tasted something unpleasant. That made our benefactors, well, they weren't very happy. They left us in our own devices for a short time, but seeing our failure at recovering him, they, well, they imparted new knowledge on some of our team in a very unpleasant fashion. A way of finding him and regaining what was lost. You see, there are infinite realities, but there are not infinite versions of everything in those realities. And with some things, and even some people, there are only ever a few versions. We call these things and people primes. There are benefits to being a prime. They tend to be luckier than average and live long lives, but nothing that remarkable. Well, there are a few notable exceptions, but the point is that the universe just seems to protect them a bit better, give them a bit of extra cushion, plot armor, if you will. And that plot armor gets stronger, the fewer versions of a particular prime that are left. Solomon sighed. That being said, there is a threshold. Don't ask me what it is, because it apparently involves so many variables that even our math guides can't really predict it. Where if there are few enough of a particular person or thing, a particular prime, the balance shifts back the other way. Instead of the universe just projecting the versions of that prime, it starts simultaneously attacking them too, thinning them out, trying as best we understand to reach singularity. He pointed at me. You and Thomas are alternate versions of a prime, and based on what we've been told recently, you're likely the last two versions. So far, your luck and his have held out, but it's only a matter of time. It's coming down to a tug of war between the two of you, and it's a contest you'll lose. I didn't believe any of this shit, but I couldn't help but ask the question. Why? Why are you so sure I'd lose instead of this supposed alternate version who escaped? Solomon smiled thinly. Two reasons. The first is that apparently as things grow closer to there being only one prime, the remaining versions begin to suffer symptoms. The version that is most likely to be the survivor, the singular prime, tends to get blackouts or memory gaps. They often have trouble with certain ideas or words. All the rest, the losers, they begin feeling the echoes of each other dying as the universe eats them one at a time. Those phantom pains you've been having more and more frequently... Those are the times that another version of you died. I felt a ball of ice beginning to form in my stomach. Okay. What's the second reason? The man looked more serious now. Thomas has something inside of him. Something that's protecting him. He was already showing signs of being on track to being a singular prime before it was implanted. Memory loss, a special connection with another past, a valuable asset, but we were ignorant of what these symptoms actually meant until our recent... education. But, with his implanted ally, he has something making sure that he stays safe. And as I hope I've made clear, his safety means your doom. I stood up and began pacing. When I glanced back, I saw that Solomon had produced a small gun, but he only watched as I went back to walking. 
So what is all this? Why am I here? What do you want from me? We believe that you can find your alternate self where we cannot. That the safeguards that hid him won't apply to you. So we want you to find him and bring him back here. This may sound like a daunting task, but we have it on good authority that you have a significant likelihood of success. I stopped walking again and stared at him. So you want me to go find this alternative Wally or Thomas or whatever and kidnap him? Bring him back to you assholes? Solomon's face darkened slightly as he nodded. Precisely. If you do that, you'll be free. More than that, we can aid you in selecting one of the better versions of your life to set up shop in. They're all up for grabs except for yours and Thomas's. He chuckled darkly. <laughs> and trust me, you don't want his. I frowned. Because you're going to kill him, right? Or are you going to leave me alive and let the universe eat me away? Because from what you've said, there can be only one of us left before it stops. Solomon regarded me for a moment as he raised a finger and pointed it at me. That's a good point, and one you'll have to trust us on a bit. But I assure you, once we have extracted what we need from Thomas, you'll find yourselves safe and sound, and in a new, better life, and you'll never hear from us again. Uh, no. The man frowned. I understand this is a lot to wrap your... No. I understand it fine. I believe what you're saying. You destroyed my life, or at least gave the universe a helping hand, all to see if I was the best candidate to send after this guy, Thomas, who is, again, according to you, an alternate version of me. Who you'd locked up for some god-awful reason. Now you're trying to manipulate me into going and hunting him down based on a promise that you'll give me a new life that used to belong to yet another version of me that you probably also had a hand in murdering. That's somewhat about up. Solomon shrugged. Well, that's largely accurate, but fuck you. That's my answer. Fuck you. I'm not hurting anybody, and I'm sure as fuck not helping you. You want him? Go get him your fucking self. Solomon's face went pale with what looked like a combination of fear and anger. As I've already said, we have tried. We failed. If we fail again... Well, we can't fail again. I shrugged. I was brimming with anger, and I knew that I was likely about to die or get tortured, but I didn't care. Sounds like your bosses are just like you. Giant assholes. You're fucking bad luck. The man stood up, his lips stretched tight. I can see attempts at being honest and civil are pointless. He looked at the camera in the corner of the room. Take him. A moment later, the door opened. Several large men in scrubs came in and took me to the floor, and while I struggled, it was no use. Within a matter of seconds, they'd injected me with something, and I felt my body growing heavy and numb. I saw the room shift as I was put on what I guessed was a gurney of some kind and moved to the hallway. We traveled down several halls before coming to another room. When they wheeled me in, I saw it was already occupied. There was a monster inside. The thing was chained down and had wires and various prods covering the enormous worm-like length of its pale red flesh, and as we entered I saw it turn what I supposed was its head toward us. It moved tentacles studded with black rocks and oozing a gray liquid in a gesture that might be a threat, but seemed more like a plea for help. I had a feeling that whatever it was, it was a prisoner here too. I found myself overwhelmed with terror and despair, and my inability to move more than my head or to even scream made it all worse somehow. Not that I thought I could escape or convince them to let me go. Any hope of that had already died. I just wanted to cry out that, at how wrong and unfair it all was. One final protest before the end. As if reading my mind, Solomon appeared over me again. As if reading my mind, Solomon appeared over me again. Oh, never fear, Wally. You're not about to die. Nothing so fortunate for you. My hope had been that you'd be reasonable. 
Willing participants are always preferred in our line of work, but since you won't listen to common sense, we'll have to change your mind for you. He gestured in the direction of the monster, filling the far half of the room. This big fellow was from Iceland. Well, not originally, I suppose, but that's where we got him. He looks pretty terrible, but even in his dismissed condition, he still has a very special gift. The man smiled at me coldly. He can destroy and create memories. It's not my preferred method for gaining your cooperation, but desperate times and all that. I saw rather than felt him pat my shoulder. You just lay back and relax. Trust me. A few days with him, and you'll be like a new man. Day 2 version of written mnemonic summary narrative by Subject Wally. At the time of this summary, the Wally Project is progressing within predictive parameters. This narrative is classified and not to be accessed by anyone other than the active members of the Thomas Project, its temporary Wally Project sub-branch, and living members of the kin.